Martin. So we are recording this just so everybody knows that this is going to be recorded. Um, so my name is Susan Spicka. I am the Executive Director of Education Voters of Pennsylvania. We are a statewide organization that works to build support for policies that will strengthen public schools. And we really have a focus on equity in education, making sure that all students have an equal opportunity to learn, thrive, and succeed in their public schools. So we are just thrilled today to have here um, three different guests who will introduce themselves as we get to them in the as we move forward. Um, we have Lisa Leitner, who is a parent and a, a really strong advocate for students with disabilities. We have uh, State Representative Dan Miller, again, a really strong advocate for students with disabilities. And then we also have Dr. Sam Lee, who's a superintendent at the Ben Salem School District. So we're gonna hear a lot of different perspectives from different people about the issue of special education funding and charter schools so that we can um, kind of give an overview of what the issues are, um, what the solutions are to some of these problems and like what the real impact is on both students and um, on students and on school districts and taxpayers. And so, um, we have we would ask that everybody stay muted during this presentation and since we were expecting a pretty big group we actually disabled the chat so if you have questions you can just um hold them to the end and then raise your hand and we have sharon ward here who is running the back end of this and she will unmute you and then um allow you to ask your questions at the end so let's get going here so um, Education Voters of Pennsylvania, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We're a project of the Keystone Research Center. So we're here today to talk about special education funding and charter schools. And so I think we need to start off by talking about the, the basis. There are two different systems for funding special education in Pennsylvania. There's one system for school districts where funding is based on the special education funding formula that differentiate students into three cost tiers according to their level of need. And school districts receive their funding, less funding for students who have needs that require fewer costs, more funding for students who require more, more services. Charter schools, on the other hand, their funding is based on a one size fits all calculation that assumes 16% of each school district's students receive special education services. So in 2014, when this, the Bipartisan Special Education Funding Commission um, came together, they developed the funding formula. They recommended applying the same funding formula to charter schools and to district schools. But unfortunately, charter schools at that point lobbied successfully to be um, exempted from, this, from the, having the formula apply to them. There we go. So the problem that we look at is, is that we're looking at, um, at voters did a report, and this is kind of a, a distillation of our report. Critics of the one size fits all charter school special education funding formula argue that it creates incentives for charter schools to enroll students whose services cost less than the per student tuition they receive from districts. And on the flip side, to deny access to students whose disability requires greater intervention and higher costs. So, um, the special education funding formula, as we said, it, it categorizes um, students into three categories. Tier one students require minimal interventions, weekly speech therapy sessions, just small interventions. Tier two students require more significant interventions, maybe one-on-one -on -one help during the school day, a self-contained classroom, um, physical or occupational therapy. And then tier three students require more extensive and costly interventions. They might need a full-time nurse or specialized care or an out of district placement. Um, so with the, the um, funding for charter schools right now, there is no relationship between the cost of services that a student required, that a student requires, and the tuition payment that the school district makes to the charter school. So every year, school districts make tuition payments for each student who goes to a charter school. Regular education students get one tuition rate, special education students get a different tuition rate. So um, in a school district, if there's a student whose education costs $15,000, the, the school district just pays that $15,000. At a charter school, if the student, um, it costs $15,000 to educate that student, the charter school might get a tuition rate from the school district 
that is 15,000 to 48,000. We're now, this is a little dated, we're now up to about $55,000 is the uh, highest tuition rate for special education in the state right now. Um, so students whose services cost less than the tuition rate, they are a financial gain for the charter schools. Students whose services exceed the tuition rate are a financial loss. And so there is a real incentive in the system for charter schools to gain the system. Um, so we can see like this is an actual case for student A who requires minimal services, the charter school receives $27,000. It only costs them $15,000. So they get $12,000 in excess special education funding that they are allowed to do whatever they want with. They do not have to spend it on services for students with disabilities. They can spend it on anything. So they can spend it on advertising, CEO salaries, whatever they want. But the flip side is that if there's a student who requires additional, like more services, maybe needs a full-time aid and that it would cost $35,000 to educate that student, the payment to the charter school is still only $27,000. So it actually would be difficult for a charter school to accept a student who has costs that exceed the tuition rate. Um, and that is a problem. That is a problem for students and it really significantly limits their choice. So um, the next couple slides are just kind of the nitty gritty. Um, so the charter school tuition calculation takes the school district's budgeted special expenditure, budgeted special education expenditures, um, not, it deducts it from the regular education tuition. Um, it divides it by the ADM, the number of students in the school district, but it's not actually divided by the actual number of students in the school district. It's divided by 16% of the number of schools and students in the school district. That, that is just in the calculation. This has not been changed since 1997. For whatever reason, this, ca this calculation assumes every school educates 16% of their students in special education. Then this little tuition chunk for special ed is added to the regular charter school tuition rate, and then you get your special education tuition rate. Now, when we wanna just talk about the 16% problem, this just shows um, a distribution of school districts the black line, um, anything to the left, is school districts that have fewer than 16% of their students receiving special education services. To the right, it is um, districts that have more. And so I think we can see it is 406 school districts have more than 16% of their students um, designated as special education. So this just kind of lays out the problem um, for a fictitious school district. If we were to use the actual number of students in the school district who receive special education services, and we were to divide the total amount spent on special education by the actual number of students, we would find that the school district is actually spending like on average, on average, $14,700 per student. But the, we, the, when, we, when the calculation for the tuition is done, the calculation is not done using the actual percentage of students in the actual number of students receiving special education services. Instead, this artificial number, 16% is used. So the, the pot of money, the pot of special education funding is divided by a lower number. And so if you think about a, a pizza, if you have a pizza and you divide it into four pieces, a lower number, you get really big pieces. If you get a pizza and you divide it into 10 pieces, everybody gets a smaller piece. So with this tuition calculation, a school district that has more than 16% of, of their students um, receiving special education services is actually paying the charter school more per student than they are able to keep in their own district and, and spend on their own students in the district. And um, the median amount, the median percentage of students with, who receive special education in school districts is 19.9%. So this is very typical. Um, in this school district, they spend $3,500 more on special education funding per charter school student than they spend on kids who remain in the district schools. Um, statewide, a typical school district is paying a charter school nearly 25% more um, for each student that goes to a charter school than on average than they have to spend on schools on students who remain in their district schools. So just using the actual percentage would save $65 million annually um, to taxpayers and it would equalize the funding. So um, 
And why does this matter? Why do we care if we're sending excess special education funding to charter schools? Well, this chart shows um, the financial impact that special education costs have had on school districts over the past 10 years. The bottom bar that's black is state revenue. That is basically flatlined over the past decade. The yellow bar is uh, federal funding, again, that's remained about the same, but the teal bar, it shows the growth in special education expenditures in school districts in Pennsylvania. Close to $2 billion in increased costs over the past 10 years. Um, that, and, and with very little state funding increase, it means that school districts have been forced to come up with on their own $1.8 billion in either new local revenues through higher property taxes, or they have to find this money someplace else in their budget and they have to cut other programs. Um, the state, we call it a staggering story of state neglect. The state has not provided funding. So when we're sending extra special education dollars, excess special education money to charter schools that they are not spending on services for, for students with disabilities, it's all coming from property taxes. Um, so we just took a look at enrollment and we, were, we said, we said you know, if if there is um, a if schools are discriminating based on special education costs, they will have more than the expected number of students in the lowest cost category, category one, which is the yellow bar, and they would have fewer students in the higher cost categories, which are the blue bars on the end. And lo and behold, when we looked at the data, we looked at at, at student enrollment in tier one, two, and three in every charter school and every school district in the state, and what we found was um, districts educate 90.2% of students, their students are in tier one, 6.9% are in tier two and the rest are in the upper tiers. But when we look at charter schools, they do in fact educate a higher percentage of students in tier one than we would expect if this was a non-biased system. Um, then we broke it down and we looked at cyber charter schools. So the top bar here is school districts. Again, school districts only have 90% of their students in tier one. Non-cyber charter schools, all the brick and mortar charter schools, they have 95%. The big cyber charter schools have 95%. And then those are the four biggest cyber charter schools. The rest of the cyber charter schools have virtually no students who require any kind of significant, um, have disabilities who require significant services. Um, and then when we looked around the state, we found 41% of charters enroll no students in tier two or tier three, which means they're enrolling no students who require significant services. Yet, when we remember that payment, they're getting paid as though they are educating all students, including students who have, require higher services. So in Philadelphia, there are 24 schools that have no tier two or tier three students. In Pittsburgh, there are 22, that's 36%. And then when we go and look through the rest of the state, it's even worse. So in the Lehigh Valley and in the Dauphin County, three quarters of the charter schools enroll no students. In Erie County, zero. Charter schools enroll zero students in tiers two and tier three. And then in nine counties, all of these schools enroll, enroll zero students in tiers two and tiers three. So if you go to our website, you can look for yourself at the data and we have an appendix that shows every charter school and every school district and their percentage of students in these tiers. So what was our conclusion? Our conclusion is that charter school enrollment patterns are consistent with the likelihood that many charter schools are gaming the funding system by cherry picking students with low cost special education needs and discriminating against students with high cost needs. Um, it, you know, and we said school districts have to raise taxes or cut teachers and programs for students in their districts, or they have to skimp on services for the students with disabilities that they have so that they can send excess special education payments to charter schools and then these things are wasted on any on whatever they want not and are not this money is not spent providing services to students with disabilities and here's just one example the pittsburgh public schools um, you know we saw that a large number of schools don't provide services to students with, they don't enroll students who have disabilities that require any significant additional funding yet every Every student who has received special education services in the Pittsburgh Public School District takes with him $42,000 from his school. So they write a check for $42,000 for every special education student in a charter school when it is really clear that most of these charter schools are not educating students who require that kind of funding. So 
um, there are a couple solutions. The best and fairest solution, which is in um, House Bill 272 right now, would be to just apply the special education funding formula to charter schools. So instead of getting a lump sum flat rate, charter schools would get funding that would be based on the tiers. Less money for students in tier one, a lot more money for students in tier three. It would more closely wrap, tie the funding to actual costs, and it would really reduce the incentives for charter schools to cherry pick students and would also improve opportunities for school choice for students with disabilities because if somebody if there was a child who had a significant you know um, needed significant services the money would follow that child to be able to pay for those services if that if there is no will in the general assembly to do that um, just simply allowing school districts to use the actual percentage of students who receive special education as the, the divisor in the charter school calculation that would equalize, so at least there would be an average amount per student that would be the same for school district and charter school students. That would save $65 million. Um, and Ed Voters feels very, very strongly that the General Assembly should enact a law requiring charter schools to return special education funding that is not used to provide services for students with disabilities. It is just, it is wrong that charter schools can take special education funding that local taxpayers have raised through hard, hard property tax increases, and then they can use that money for whatever they want. So um, I thank you for joining us today. Um, our, our, our website is educationvoterspa.org. And so if you want to comment or you know talk to me or anything, you can find my contact information there or I'm stick at educationvoterspa.org. And so I am going to turn this over to Lisa Leitner now so she can talk about what this means um, from the perspective of a parent. Thanks, Hi. Um, yep. Thanks. Um, thanks for having me today, Susan, and thank you for everyone who's you know taking their lunch break with us here today. Um, I'm Lisa Leitner, and I live in the southeastern corner of the state. Um, I've been an IEP and family special education uh, advocate and lobbyist for about 12 years. Um, I love to talk about all things special ed, um, but when I talk about this particular issue, I just want to preface this with I met I met with a lot of um, well, what about this? And IDEA was never fully funded and state funding isn't keeping up. And um, well, my son was in a traditional public and now he's in a charter and he's just thriving and he has an IEP. Um, you know, and I want all of Pennsylvania's kids to have their needs met. There is nothing I want more than for my job as a family advocate to be obsolete and that every child's special education needs are being met and you didn't need me to help you anymore. Um, I truly am glad when people get their situations resolved. Um, and yes, over you know what I've learned over the past 12 years, there's a lot of moving parts to this. But just because we can't fix all of it today doesn't mean that we don't try to fix some of it or fix fix it piece by piece. Um, I invite each Pennsylvania taxpayer to look at each is issue regarding charter funding and public education funding individually and as part of a much larger picture, because there are a lot of straw man arguments and false narratives that come up when it talks when it comes to talking about funding charter schools. Um, and this is kind of like a low hanging fruit. You know, yes, I'm constantly in, in contact with Senator Casey's office about full funding of IDEA, and we've been trying to get momentum behind that forever. Um, but this is not only unfair, but it's um, allowing allowing some schools to operate like they're private schools with public school funding. And not only are they doing that, but they're doing that on the backs of our most vulnerable students, those in, in tier two and, two, and tier three. Um, as you showed us, you know, the data doesn't lie. We know that um, charters are taking in a disproportionate number of tier one. And in many cases, you know, as many as half of the schools are not taking in any tier, and two, uh, tier two and tier three students. Um, some I've found with direct work of families that some charter personnel are just really misinformed um, because they are supposed to operate like public schools and some will just directly tell the parent, um, we can't meet your child's needs here, you need to go back to your home district. Um, and they're just outright turned away from the charter school, um, not knowing that as a public, that, you know, that they are a public as well and that they are required to take in um, these students. But what is really unfortunate is the more subtle 
things that happen to families and our kids aren't welcome in private schools. We have to rely on the public schools and we have to rely on the public schools more than the average family. And it's our relationships that are often the most contentious because it all comes back to funding and it all comes back to not having enough funds to provide what our kids need. We know that no school has the resources that it needs to, per, you know, to provide. But what I've seen over the past decade is uh, once a child starts to trend toward being more needy, um, which may happen as like social and academic demands change, um, the relationship with the family and the charter school just becomes very different and it's not as warm and fuzzy and they're often even you know bullied back into their home district um, be, to the point where they're just not felt well you know they just don't feel welcome anymore so i mean i know you and i have been pushing for this change for years um it's had a lot of different names and a lot of different numbers over the years and and we've watched people retire, um, you know, who have introduced previous legislation. Um, but I don't understand how anyone could really be against a fair funding formula, which is exactly what this is, why we wouldn't want to fund the child according to what they need and, and include all of Pennsylvania's students. Um, I mean, our tax, it's our tax dollars. They should be distributed fairly. There should be transparency. It should have to be returned to districts. Um, because it's, you know, again, this is, we're talking about Pennsylvania's most vulnerable students. Um, and that's who's, that's who's really losing out on this. Great. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate that. And you, you are tireless in your efforts with students. And so I think we are going to now go to uh, Representative Dan Miller, who's been in Harrisburg, um, kind of really advocating for, you know, vulnerable students for a long time. So thank you, Representative Miller. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invite and uh, I love your uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, thank you for sharing all that information. You know, Lisa, of course, says so many, uh, so, so many good things. Uh, um, uh, so I, I definitely appreciate her uh, thoughts as well. Um, you know, look, we, we, these issues, unfortunately, are not new. Um, and uh, in the legislature, we have been um, uh, trying to address uh, certain uh, shortcomings. Um, uh, you know, definitely since I've been uh, there. Um, and so each term, it seems almost we continue to recycle through different versions of, of uh, solutions that we think can um, make the best use of uh, the limited resources that we have to uh, uh, educate every child. Uh, and clearly, um, uh, your charts in particular showed some of the um, promises not kept uh, by the federal government. That's true. And uh, uh, Lisa and uh, your charts references uh, how little um, state funding in some ways have kept up with some of the costs that have been pushed uh, to the local districts. Again, that's true. Um, and uh, I know to some degree people say, well, you know, uh, almost like saying like $65 million isn't a lot of money when you're talking about uh, several billion. $65 million uh, rescues a lot of kids. Uh, and uh, when that money is applied appropriately, it, it can be game changing uh, and it should be game changing. Uh, and that's what uh, we're talking about. I think uh, Lisa also mentioned there are success stories. Clearly, there are success stories uh, to talk about. Um, the point about this is that I can tell you that in my time in Harrisburg, if we were to find such imbalance as far as for almost any funding issue, um, uh, my friends on the other side in particular would, would, would be uh, first to kind of to, to jump on that. Uh, here, uh, when it comes to the uh, special education costs, for charters, we, we seem to have struggled to, to find some traction to even really discuss to get close to addressing it, let alone addressing it. Um, there's a House bill that, uh, that I've introduced along with my friend, Representative Benham, uh, uh, 534. Uh, and 534 goes to sort of the heart of, of where sort of the discussion is today by recognizing the tiered um, uh, approach to, um, uh, to matching actual costs uh, in a better way for uh, for kids. And look, I want to also echo that when, no matter where the, the child is being educated, whether it be with an IEP or not IEP, uh, I want that child to receive uh, fantastic supports and, and everything that child needs to help them learn. So I'm always for that, no matter again where that child goes, charter or not charter, doesn't matter, I'm for that. Uh, that being said, um, 
uh, we need that, those dollars to match expenses and we need to be able to uh, apply every resource that we have uh, to be sure that every child is, is having um, uh, opportunity. So uh, what the bill does here is it, 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 it goes off those three tiers that, that you had so referenced, uh, works off a, of a multiplier uh, and then uh, make sure that the uh, reimbursement, the cost is, is appropriate in line. Uh, clearly, as you referenced, a lot of the tier two and tier three kids they ain't going right now. They ain't going, right? So um, uh, you shouldn't be paid as if they are, right? So, and, and that's what uh, 534 would do. So um, as I said, this has not been a bill that, that we came up with, uh, Jessica and I, uh, last month. It has not been an issue that uh, is brand new to the stage. It is an issue that we, we struggle to get traction. Uh, my hope is that this, as well as some other issues here that would um, at the very least, seek to uh, address some of the challenges that we have seen. Um, again, not to say that every charter school is somehow uh, not providing good education or haven't even picked up uh, some things where they had or where they where it need to be picked up. For example, um, you know there are kids who obviously go to a charter school and then an IEP follows. And yes, some people would say, well, you know, uh, they occasionally will say, well. Uh, question whether or not uh, that is the appropriate mechanism or step for people to go um, since they didn't have an IEP be before they left. And many times it is. Many times that's exactly right. And so, uh, again, I'm for t uh, every IEP uh, to be fully funded and supported no matter where they go. But what we don't want to see happen is there's no uh, value to it at all in relation to uh, a doubling, a tripling of the payment, uh, which is uh, not being used to educate that child. It's common sense. Uh, just works across the board. And this is what we have to try and do in, in Harrisburg. Um, and um, I'm no longer on the education committee. Um, I do very much appreciate the majority chair. I've always found him to be very responsive to my request. We've had many uh, positive conversations. Uh, but we have struggled to, to bring 534 and its predecessors and its related bills uh, to actual votes. Um, and in today's times, uh, arguably more than ever, uh, where if it wasn't for some assistance, uh, we, we could be facing horrendous decisions in relation to our state budget. And we're still going to see how the infusion of, of federal supports from the, the uh, Biden administration uh, in particular will, will be helpful. Um, but um, uh, we need that $65 million and, and, and everything else across the board to be appropriately applied. So uh, that's why I think 534 is so appropriate uh, at this time. That's why I think it should be brought up um, at, you know, we got days coming and it won't take long once we get moving, right? So we could get this through if they would just give us a chance to bring it up and I think we would do it. So I would urge everybody, by the way, if you support this issue, if you care about these concerns and wanna be sure that things are funded appropriately and the resources are, are, are where they need to be and that, and that the public schools aren't are building away um, our traditional public schools aren't built away uh, in a way that's inappropriate, then um, uh, send an email or a call to your legislature. Mention 534, okay, with me and again, my friend, Rep Representative Benham, and, and uh, hopefully we can get some more momentum behind it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Miller. You've been in this fight for a very long time. Thank you. And now um, we have Dr. Sam Lee from, he's the superintendent of the Ben Salem School District. And he is going to kind of talk to us a little bit about what this means uh, for an actual school district. So we can see it from another perspective. Uh, thank you, Susan. And uh, thank you, Mrs. Leitner and Representative Miller uh, for introducing and, and uh, advancing 534. Uh, speaking of which, um, if we matched services and expenses with expenditures it it would save ben salem school district between one and a half million and 1.6 million every year in special ed costs just in our in-town brick and mortar uh, charter school here and by the way they're a good school they're a good neighbor they're a good colleague and uh, serve their students well um, we uh, at Ben Salem are a district of 6,300 uh, students and in, in the Southeast, we border Philadelphia. Uh, we have 22% of our students are special learners. Uh, our in-town uh, charter has a much lower percentage of special learners. They have 14 beyond tier one. And as I mentioned, if the 
funding were uh, associated with the services provided, it would be a savings just in our one brick and mortar charter of one and a half to $1.6 million a year. So significant, impactful. Uh, our district is a, a relatively fair, good sized district. Uh, as I, I mentioned, our enrollment, um, we're a $160 million a, a year entity. Um, 17 million of that goes to charter school tuition. Our uh, regular ed tuition is 13,000 and our special learners, we provide $36,000 in tuition costs to our, all our charters, a vast majority of them right here at, at our in-town in charter. So significant for us in money retained to serve our students here in Ben Salem. Uh, we think we do it well. We're especially proud of our, our special education programs and our special learners, their accomplishments, their achievements, and ultimately their life's work and contributions to our community. Um, we're interested in uh, monitoring the progress of 534 Representative Miller and uh, House Bill 272, which I believe our own Representative Tomlinson has supported here in Bucks County. Um, we are a district that prides ourselves, and I think I shared this, and I hope I'm giving this impression, in taking care of all of our kids. Uh, we so, to the point that we've exerted maximum tax effort uh, to the Act 1 index since 2007 and in the interest of providing for our kids through a great recession and now a COVID economy where we're going to see revenues uh, decline for the foreseeable future here in Ben Salem. But our obligation toward our charter school students is not going to change unless changes enacted in Harrisburg. So our kids, we may be challenged to maintain our mission related to 6,300 students here in Ben Salem, but that those same challenges, and I don't want that for anybody, please know that those cha same challenges won't be transferred to our charter school students. Thank you, thank you. Um, Dr. Lee. And so, you know, just if, if you're, if you're just watching like $1.5 million, what, you know, like, could you just kind of think about like, what could you pay for in your school district? With, if you didn't have to spend $1.5 billion on um, excess funding to the, to cyber charters or to charter schools. Well, well that's just to give a little perspective. 15 teachers, mm -hmm. reduce class size, uh, additional supervision and oversight for uh, our academic programs, um, maintenance, upkeep of our physical plant. Uh, as you all know, and we all had to grow our technology footprint through COVID. Um, we were the beneficiary of uh, federal funds to advance and support that. Uh, but, uh, but along with that, uh, there's upkeep and maintenance of peripherals, devices, processes, support, and professional development related to all that. So I, I could go on, uh, mm -hmm. one and a half uh, to 1.6 million is, is uh, a lot of money and, and no small thing for us. Um, and, and I also wanna mention, uh, I think I, they're a good school, our in-house brick and mortar. They, they, do, they do a good job taking care of their kids. Um, they're, they have a budget of 22 million. They also have a fund balance of 14 million. That's, inc that's significant. Wow. Wow. That's significant. Yep. Well, thank you. Thank you. So I think we are gonna move on to questions. And so um, Sharon's gonna call on people who have their hands up. So if you would like to ask a question, just please raise your hand and then Sharon will ask you to unmute and um, we'll go from there. Great. Um, our first questioner, is uh, Benita McKay. So Makita, Benita, you're unmuted and please ask your question. Uh, good afternoon. And I really wanna thank you guys for having this webinar. It's really been informative. 
Um, one of my questions is, is that I'm looking at a population that's growing of children being diagnosed with special needs, but the funding, and I understand we have the charter school funding, but the funding itself is stagnant. And it doesn't appear that our school districts are even getting that increase in funding to compensate for the number of students who are coming in. And as a result, I'm seeing more students not getting the services that they need, um, which could be maybe curriculum, maybe one-to-one. -one. It could also be supports for school personnel, which is a big piece in Philadelphia that is lacking. Um, yeah, I, could, I mean, I think I can answer that a little bit. Um, and I addressed it early on in my talk, that is just one of the many moving parts as far as education funding, special education funding. Um, you know, as we said, IDEA has never been fully funded for 45 years, right? And now state funding has not kept up with the pace of the increased special ed funding, which is, you know, a result of a lot of things. It's um, better diagnostics. It's, um, you know, that we know more now than we did 45 years ago as far as what these kids need and what interventions and strategies work for them. Um, but they do cost money. Um, but again, this, this particular bill and this particular overpayments to charter schools and not applying the fair funding formula, that is like some low hanging fruit. I mean, that's talking about we could recoup a hundred million dollars. Um, and you know, what could the state do with an extra hundred million dollars for special ed that's, that's currently allocated for special ed right now, but it's not being spent on special ed. It's being spent on, well, they don't even have to tell us actually, which is, which is unfortunate. Um, they can just spend it on whatever they wish, or even just as what it sounds like it, they can hold it in their coffers if, um, if that's what they choose to do. So um, I know, you know, I've seen your name around and I know um, your position and I know that you're engaged in a lot of advocacy and lobbying work. Um, so I would just encourage you and all of the reach that you have to encourage the parents Again, there's a lot of moving parts to this, but this one is some low hanging fruit where we could see some real gains um, immediately and some real money to districts immediately that might result in, you know, new teacher positions as Dr. Lee said, you know, this is like some tangible stuff that could happen soon. And it's, it's gonna be a crisis mode. If we hit this pandemic, you know, the, the threshold of the pandemic and la lack of tax dollars and all that other stuff, and this doesn't get fixed, it's going to get much, much worse. Yeah, and, and um, uh, thank you for the question with it too. And, and look, I want to note um, that um, the governor has, uh, has always sought to increase. Uh, my caucus has always sought to increase, and indeed some of the increases, of course, have had bipartisan support. Uh, but we are increasing um, uh, too slowly, uh, let's just say it that way. And as uh, Lisa, of course, had mentioned, is that there, this is where the dollars we have need to be so tailored. Um, but look, we, um, um, I don't believe that the state is, is doing enough to assist where we need to be. Uh, that is, like I, uh, and I say that in reference to clearly some of the proposals that would be helpful. Um, you know, we have struggled, I think, and it's something that, that is still an issue with uh, just uh, almost a lack of understanding as to what these services do um, and the impact of them. Uh, and there still is a gap uh, both in and outside the legislature as to not only their importance and their value, but uh, the legal responsibilities that need to be met um, uh, in providing them. Uh, and again, it is a lot to dump onto a school district um, on itself, especially some that are, are maybe more economically challenged than others, and some that have been historically challenged. So uh, there is a lot there to be done. Uh, I don't want to say that there aren't proposals to increase it. Clearly there are, uh, but they end up, uh, unfortunately, being lower than uh, initially proposed uh, all too often uh, to a point to where it, it is a, um, a very small increase, uh, proportionally, that comes across. But your, your point is well taken. Okay, um, let us go on to our next questioner, um, Dara Allen. Hi, 
Um, I'm in Pittsburgh at City Charter High School, and um, I have experience in both a traditional district um, at an administrative um, supervisory level and currently at, at a charter school. And so um, I think in having this conversation, I just wish there were more forums where we could listen to each other versus talk at each other from our various um, viewpoints. And I say that to say is because I have been on both sides. And, um, you know, I think the issue around, we should talk about fully funding IDA, ID, um, IDEA and um, increasing, you know, the pie versus I think, you know, um, pitting, um, you know, this argument against, you know, one another. You know, no parent wants to um, have their child go to a poor performing school, whether it's traditional or public. And public charter schools are not allowed to deny students from attending. So there needs, if, that, if that's happening, then there needs to be issues versus, you know, this is what we think is happening. If people are, if schools are doing that, then, then that's an issue. But I think it also matters how the money is spent. And there's been so much that was said as it relates to assumptions. So just, you know, to give you a perspective is, you know, our school is a school that um, integrates learning support teachers, team teaching and students and teachers that loop with their students. So they get to know their students as learners and they get them to the finish line and have high expectations for them, high supports. And so when we say that we have a 95% a graduation rate, our special education students and learning support students are also at that level because of the way we're spending um, our, the, our money and the way our school is designed, looping, relationships, integrated um, support. Um, we're not going out and try to find um, special education students, but uh, families do know that we support our students when they come to us. So that is troubling to me to hear that, that there are schools that are um, trying to make folks um, special ed or whatever. I just wonder how many of those are specific cases versus you know, hearsay because I know other educators in, in traditional and in charters that are, are doing their best um, at educating students and having the best interest at heart. And so I just hope that we have more discussions where we can actually like hear each other and figure out what are strategies that are working for special education students versus a, a, it what sounds like a, a lot of assumptions. Um, Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I I just wanted to say that, you know, we, there are, have been lawsuits that have been filed against charter schools where parents have won, and it has been shown that charter schools actually were discriminating against students, and, and I think you're probably aware of one that happened with City Charter High School before you came there, and so this does happen. A lot of times parents don't understand that it is their right to have their child attend a charter school. And so it is a lot to ask the parents to go find a lawyer to go sue a charter school when they're in the middle of trying to find a school for their kids. But I'm gonna let Lisa speak to this next. Yeah, and that's, that's um, yes, that's, there's a lot of tricky words I think are used, um, you know, tuition free and things like that, that parents don't really understand that um, charter schools are public schools. Um, also that, you know, their child is struggling, their child's needs are not being met at the school. And yes, this is firsthand. I've been, I've been to more IEP meetings and over the past 12 years, hundreds of them. Um, and this is stuff that I've witnessed firsthand. This isn't me, you know, gossiping or pulling hearsay, um, out of, out of the, out of the air. Um, this is stuff that I've had families experience. And to that, I'd say, you know, Yes, they don't have money for an attorney. They're already a family in crisis. Their child may be having behaviors. Their child's falling behind in their academics. And it's a lot to absorb at one time without going after, you know, and trying to force someone to do the right thing. Because another thing about special ed is that, you know, the due process and repercussions or recourse that parents have is minimal, right? Um, if, unless a parent files for due process, it is assumed that things are going well. And that is not the case. Um, just because I am for the fair funding formula and these um, particular statutes doesn't mean that I think that all public schools are doing a stellar job with public ed with uh, special education. They're not, there's a lot that are struggling. Um, but let's start to level the playing field and, and put the money where, where it's rightfully owed. 
Uh, and Ms. Allen, thank you for your comments uh, and for, for joining us uh, today. So, um, you know, look, I, I do feel, I, I think myself and, and Sam both referenced a bit uh, that, that we're aware of, of some good work that, that is done. Um, I do think that there, I would admit to you that I, I, I do at times question that the way forward um, is, is, is through what I consider to be a, little, a bit of a division uh, in education. Um, I, I do probably start from a framework that is not um, perhaps uh, your experience. Uh, that being said, I think you said Pittsburgh, of course, right? I'm here in Pittsburgh. Uh, invite me. I will gladly come over. We'll, we'll, we'll make some time and, and we'll talk. And uh, no matter what, I, I very much thank you for, for joining. Even uh, it is always important, even when we hear something that may perhaps not be directly in line, uh, that, that we are at the table uh, together. It is not something that often happens too much in Harrisburg. I will tell you that that uh, that that is part of the problem, you know, for it. Uh, but um, but again, um, uh, when things are appropriate or, or any time, uh, extend an invite. I'll gladly make some more more time. We, we can talk together. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Okay. Um, thanks for that, everyone. And let me get our next questioner, uh, Bill Wood. Bill Wood, you can join us if you're on. Thanks very much. Hey, Lisa, good to see you. Um, I know I'm swimming upstream a little bit on this, but um, I've been on the PSBA Charter Task Force reform. Um, I'm working with Barry Feinberg now on the, the PA Charter change. So I've been, I've been working with this for a long time, digging into it. Um, and it really feels to me, I've asked this question, nobody can give me an answer why not, that if we're going to be fair about this, we should base reimbursement on the actual cost for each student. Uh, as was presented in the uh, presentation slides, you know, the districts do divide uh, based on their total special education cost. Um, you know, the IEPs obviously track um, how much is being spent on those students. Um, so, I mean, I understand that the easiest way to go about it is to simply move the three-tiered funding formula over to uh, apply it to charter schools. But if we're really going to try to fix this and be fair about it, uh, it seems to me that we should just look at what is the actual cost uh, for special education for each student. You, know, you take the standard education and then look at the additional that is being spent for the, the special education needs of that student. Um, I've asked the question a lot. No one's given me an answer from my own business manager to our, our charter school in our, our district of why we couldn't do that. So I um, just want to throw that out there for everybody listening. Yeah, uh, Bill, I, I don't think that there's there's objection to that type of uh, thought at all. Um, we are struggling right now to just agreement on, on three tiers, right? So, um, uh, if the, you know, if, if we can get to a point where uh, we are uh, specific with everything, I, I, you know, for those I think who are, are, are more in line with my thought with it, I think we gladly roll. But we do struggle right now in just trying to get generalization that's a little bit more specific, obviously, than where we are currently. So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's there's some disagreement on trying to get to to actual cost. I think that's I think that's direction. I just think we're we're, we're struggling to even get where we are now. But yeah, I, I just feel like if we're going to try to fix it, we might as well try to fix it in a way that truly is well, fair. I like your attitude, so. Bill. I like your attitude. What what, what town are you from, Bill? Uh, I'm in I'm in Avon Grove School District on, on the board. All right, brother. So look, here's what we need to do. We need to get you elected. <laughs> Coming to Harris. <laughs> Re-elected. <laughs> no, I mean with us. <laughs> right, thanks, oh. Bill. <laughs> okay, anyone else want to address that? I think that was well covered. Um, let's go to Kelly Price. Kelly can ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. I wanted to start by saying thank you to everyone for all of the information that you gave today. Um, I have a slightly different view because I have a special needs child and in our local district, she suffered for quite a few years with not getting the attention she needed from the school, the public schools, the brick and mortar public schools, uh, special education department. Uh, many excuses and reasons, and I have documentation as to not qualifying for services, etc. And we put her in a public cyber charter school this year, and she was 
tested and qualified for an IEP. She is thriving. Um, she receives counseling. She receives multiple services. And so I guess my two-part question is, I agree to the extent that, yes, there are inequities, but I'm not seeing the sense of the extreme inequity in funding. I'm seeing the inequity in quality of education. So if we're going to discuss funding inequities, we need to put it also at the very beginning. There's an inequity in the quality of education. So we can't fund a child based solely on where they're going if they're not getting the education they deserve from the beginning. So if we're going to do what you're saying with tiered funding, which, okay, let's say I agree with that, why should the home school district get anything for a child they're not responsible for educating? The funds should follow the child. My tax dollars should follow the child. I don't understand why the home school district should have any funds reimbursed to them at all. It should follow the child. Um, thank you. Thank you for your comment. And I'm, you know, and it's just, it's really good that your child has found a school where everything is working out. And I'm sure for your whole family, this is a very positive thing. Um, there are no, there is no reimbursement that comes to school districts from charter schools. The, the funds do follow the child. I what think I what we're saying just saying is, is, is what in the plans you were talking about, like a couple of people had mentioned about with the proposal about getting reimbursement back to the home school district with this proposal that's being planned. I think, I think I was about. referring to the overpayment to charters. Correct. Yes, correct. And Susan, maybe right. you want so, to explain that better. Yeah, so I think all we're saying is that the, the funding that follows the students should be an appropriate amount of funding that will pay for the services that that student needs. So if there is a student who needs a half an hour a week of speech therapy, there should not be $42,000 a year following that student because then the, the charter school is getting more money than they're spending on special education services. They're getting more money than they're entitled to. And then they're taking that special education funding and they're using it for something else. So I think what, I think the, the consensus here with the four of us is that special education dollars are precious. They are rare. There are not enough special education dollars to meet the needs of the students in Pennsylvania who have disabilities. And so we need to make sure that every single special education dollar is being spent meeting the needs of a student. And, you know, and, and so I think we're just saying like, send the school, send the charter school the money that they need, but don't send them more than they're gonna spend on services for this child. That's all we're saying. Anyone else wanna address this, Lisa? No, I mean, I, I kind of did in my opening presentation. I mean, I'm always glad to hear success stories. And I do know that, you know, hey, this is what I do all day, every day. This is what I live and breathe is I, I literally attend IEP meetings for a living. And my phone only rings when things aren't going well, right? No one ever calls me and says, hey, my child achieved all their goals and everything's going. So, you know, all those needs are being met. It's just so fantastic. I wanted to tell you. So I, I do only hear the worst of the worst as it is. Um, but that doesn't mean that because this particular child did better in their local charter school, that doesn't mean that you know we throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, no, then we don't fix this inequitable funding system. You know, there's, I was talking with Susan earlier, if you can, I said, if you can envision like a bucket of water and that's your special ed funding. And we have all these holes, you know, and one of the holes is, you know, IDEA not being fully funded. And another one is the state funding not keeping pace. And, but another one of the holes is that we are overpaying charters to the tune of well over a hundred million dollars. Um, we're sending them special education money that they're not spending on special education. And that's not fair to the tier two and tier three students 40% of the charter schools do not take these students and they're being funded as if they do. You know, that's, that's not right. These are our most vulnerable students. Thank you. 
Um, let's get to another question. How about uh, Kathy Clark? Hi. Bouncing around there. Hi. Um, so I just had a couple, I guess, one question maybe um, Dan Miller can answer. But I guess my understanding of the special ed funding formula was that the tiered um, tier one, tier two, tier three applied for um, traditional public schools, but only to the portion that is considered to be the new special education funding, which is like actually only 6% of the total of what public schools obtain. And then the rest of the funding for public schools was just by the traditional straight allocation. Um, I guess my understanding was that back when that started too, that was also sort of phased in so that that change when it occurred happened over time. So I guess my, it's sort of a two part question as to one, why are we asking for charter schools to do this, sort of have all of their special education funding this way when public schools don't have it that way? And two, is there anything in the bill about a phased in approach as there was for, um, regular traditional public schools. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Uh, I apologize there. Um, uh, so yeah, look, uh, I, 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 think, I think it may be slightly improving in relation to how much money gets through the new formula. Uh, the governor's proposal would more drastically speed up um, uh, ending the uh, inequity in the funding formula. So um, not quite sure how much of that will get through the finish line, but um, yeah, so we, we make changes and there's no doubt that it will take, I don't know, a generation or more at this pace for it to get to a, a semblance of equity that was at the point of the change. Um, you know, the, uh, there's no time frame uh, here uh, for this. Uh, I, I, I would look for that. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, I, I'm not quite sure why we wouldn't do that. If there isn't the cost, then I don't understand the problem with making that change um, right away. So um, again, if, if you have a, 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 a tier two child um, and uh, you're getting paid tier three rates, um, then I'm not quite sure what what the loss is to the you know to uh, educating that child by making sure that you're only getting paid um, what is the actual cost. Uh, so I, I, I don't I don't know the you know uh, I'm not sold on, on that as a problem, uh, but I would agree with you is that uh, and again I say the governor is uh, at least right in thought we could all debate how to get there that um, um, there is a the funding formula uh, changes are moving slow uh, in my opinion too slow uh, and while we can protect school districts and should. Um, we should also be um, making our funding streams more equitable as quickly as possible um, uh, before my great grandkids, uh, you know, get into the school district. Thank, Thank you, Representative Miller. And I think um, it's about one o'clock, so we're going to cut this off. And I just wanted to just point out, like when we looked at that chart, um, you can see that the, the amount of spending from the state, the amount of funding from the state is actually just a small portion of what's spent. And so the vast majority of funding for for special education is coming from property taxes. And so shifting that the money that goes through that formula is not going to have, uh, you know what I mean? It, it's not going to radically impact school districts. It's going to hurt some, it's going to benefit others, but the vast majority of funding for special education is coming from property taxes. And so um, it's just, just to put that out there. So I would just like to say thank you to everybody who joined us today. I will be sending out an email, a follow-up email. It will have the slides in it. Um, it will have my contact information. If you have questions, concerns, or anything, I will um, I will be happy to answer your questions. I will also include um, House Bill 534, at least a co-sponsorship memo, so you can kind of read through that and see what that is. We, as advocates, if this is something that you want to see happen, we are the ones who need to take action. And so there are two things. Number one, Governor Wolf proposed a $200 million increase in special education funding that would help all students with disabilities across the whole Commonwealth. We should all be asking our lawmakers to support that $200 million increase in special education funding. And then if this is an issue that you think um, needs to be changed, we really need to be calling our lawmakers um, and just asking them to please make this a priority so that we can improve school choice for students with disabilities and then also protect taxpayers from having special education dollars just get wasted on things that have nothing to do with children. So 
I thank you. Any final comments from anybody that you'd like to make, uh, Dr. Representative Miller or Lisa? Um, just uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's great to talk, and, and I definitely appreciate the attention on the issue. Thank you very much. No, no, I just wanted to say thank you and, you know, contact your people. Thank yeah. you very yeah. much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. I hope you have a good day, everybody. Thank you.